All right. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, your location. And uh, we thank you for joining us for today's Big Data Thought Leadership <laughs> Webinar entitled Improving the Customer Experience Using Big Data, Customer-Centric Measurement, and Analytics. Uh, as a couple of housekeeping items, please feel free to, you, uh, to uh, submit your questions via the chat tool. You can uh, opt to send your questions to the entire group or by selecting the drop-down panelist and host in the, in the chat menu. Uh, send it just privately to the host and the presenter. So my name is uh, David Morris, and I'll be hosting today's uh, webinar. Uh, feel free to email me if you'd like to have a big topic uh, request going forward on one of the webinars, or if you have a specific speaker you have in mind. Uh, our Big Data Thought Leadership webinar series is a monthly series which highlights key big data topics uh, by leading industry experts. It's structured as an educational series offering attendees relevant and valuable information on current big data topics. That's what it is. What it isn't is a product pitch. So if you likely showed up for that, uh, that's not going to happen, which is a good thing, I think. But we will be happy to give you one if you'd like one. Um, as a note, uh, on April 24th, EMC and VMware uh, will formally announce that uh, the formation of Pivotal, which is a new company which is comprised of several big data focused business units from EMC and uh, VMware, uh, the new Pivotal unit will be focused specifically uh, on big data and will be a standalone company jointly owned by EMC and VMware. Um, I note that is because our branding will change from CTOS and VMware to Pivotal in the future. So uh, we don't want to get lost in your uh, inbox there once that happens. So please keep that in mind. So today's big data, data thought leader is Dr. Bob Hayes. He's a chief customer officer at TCE Labs, where he leads research on customer feedback, customer experience, customer satisfaction, and customer loyalty programs for enterprise and mid-size organizations to help improve customer experience and optimize customer loyalty to drive accretive business growth. Bob has over 20 years of ex professional ex consulting experience, improving business performance through enhancing customer experience and customer loyalty programs at companies such as Oracle, Agilent Technologies, Sophos, NetSmart, and GenStar Capital, to name a few. Today he discusses how big data analytics combined with customer satisfaction and customer loyalty programs can help build a better business. In his new book, which is available on Amazon, TCE, to The Total Customer Experience, Building Businesses Through Customer-Centric Measurements and Analytics, is uh, available on Amazon, and we'll go through that today. Um, it's great to have you with us today, uh, Dr. Hayes. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, David. Uh, thanks for having me. You know, we were uh, for the audience there. We were talking yesterday, Bob, that you know this book is a, a, a big book. It's a tree, um, and takes up a tree. But um, you know, it is a, a definitive guide. I think from start to finish. Uh, so very useful for uh, people to have in measuring. You know, looking at uh, how to measure customer experience. So the question I think to kick it off here today is you know, how has big data and the growth of big data uh, contributed you know, in your research on helping companies with their uh, total customer experience? Sure. Well, I, I think a good byproduct of, of big data is the, the fact that companies are now looking at um, analytics more closely across all their business data silos. And I'll talk about that later on in the talk. Um, Let's get started actually with that. So yeah, I think it's, it's just, a, just a, a good way to, to get business to think about how best to integrate different data sources and extract value from the different databases by uh, first merging them together and finding the, the, both the causes and consequences of customer satisfaction and loyalty. So uh, as David said, uh, first of all, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, so, so today I'm going to talk of, of, about a few things that I that come from the book. And David said, "Yeah, this book is kind of big. In fact, it was it was initially bigger, and I had to drop some chapters because it was just getting too unwieldy." 
Uh, but I'm going to talk about basically five topics today. We're going to talk about the, the, the concept of customer experience management, uh, customer loyalty, what that is, how do you measure it. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, customer metrics in the context of the optimal customer survey. Uh, then I'll talk briefly about analytics, and I'll give you some examples from Oracle about how they integrate their data and what kind of insights they can find and what perhaps you can find um, with, with your different uh, data silos. And if you want more information about uh, TCE, Total Customer Experience, my new book, I, I created a, a bit.ly link, so you can follow that, and that should take you to a landing page that talks about the book, who I am, and, and why I wrote the book. Uh, first, we'll talk about customer experience, uh, experience management, and customer loyalty. So uh, customer experience management is the process of, of understanding and managing customers' interactions with and perceptions about the company and brand. And the goal of CEM is to improve the customer experience in order to optimize customer loyalty and grow your business. Uh, now, businesses collect customer feedback via surveys, social media and user communities and analyze them to provide some customer insights about the factors that might impact customer loyalty. Now, I'm a big believer that the ultimate customer variable to measure is customer loyalty. And I'm not alone in this. There, are, there seems to be a consensus among customer experience professionals that business growth depends on improving customer loyalty. And now you see that in the lower right, the relationship between customer loyalty and business growth uh, so that the, the higher loyalty you have, as you get more recommendations, people buy more, uh, people stay longer, those kinds of businesses will have uh, greater business growth. It seems kind of a, a circular reasoning, but th that's how it goes. Uh, now, again, I'm going to talk about uh, how to measure different customer metrics in the context of the optimal customer relationship survey. Uh, so let's define what a relationship survey is. Um, so a survey is a periodic survey typically conducted maybe once per year, twice per year, per year that asks customers about their experience with a company or brand. Now, these types of surveys are common in uh, customer experience management programs or voice of the customer programs or whatever you want to call them. Um, and in, in these programs, these relationship surveys serve a few purposes. Uh, they help guide company strategy. Uh, they identify causes of customer loyalty. Uh, they help improve the customer experience, and they, they help you prioritize improvement efforts that maximize return on investment. Um, now, there are four parts to a customer survey. Um, the first is customer loyalty, which is the likelihood of customers engaging in positive behaviors. Uh, there's customer experience, which uh, measures the satisfaction with important customer touch points like product, service, marketing, things like that. Uh, then there's relative performance of how you, how you rank relative to your competition. And then there's some extra questions you might want to use to, uh, that are more specific to your company or brand. So first let's talk about customer loyalty. Um, now customer loyalty, now, despite there's, uh, the consensus that customer loyalty is important, there seems to be little agreement among professionals in how it's defined and measured. And depending on who you ask, uh, you might get a different definition of customer loyalty. So I reviewed several definitions of loyalty and consolidated it down to this definition. It's a degree to which customers experience positive feelings for and engage in positive behaviors towards your company and brand. So there's kind of two types of loyalty. There's emotional which I call advocacy, and there's the behavioral loyalty, which uh, there's two kinds of, of that. There's retention and purchasing. And, and down below, you see the, the kinds of things I mean when I talk about the different conceptualizations of loyalty. So emotional loyalty, some people talk about love, uh, whether you would consider the brand, how likely you are to forgive a brand and trust a brand. So those kind of things measure the same thing, kind of emotional component. Um, behavioral side is more about you know what things customers actually do. They stay, they renew their contract, they buy, they buy more often, and they expand their usage. Okay. Uh, and also there, there's another component of of loyalty. It's it's how you measure it. There's two two kinds of ways to measure it. There's the objective measurement approach and the subjective measurement approach. And the, the top line, 
The top row is more objective, so it's more like counting things, uh, kind of like the churn rates, usage metrics, things like that. On the bottom row, it's more subjective, and those, those are more about uh, filling out surveys, uh, asking the customers their likelihood to engage in certain kinds of behaviors for the company, like how likely are you to recommend, how likely are you to renew your service contract, and things like that. Okay. Uh, and this, and I created this, this kind of a customer loyalty measurement framework to kind of help you think about how to conceptualize and measure loyalty for your company. Uh, again, the, the, the two columns represent the emotional versus behavioral types of loyalty. And again, the, the, call, the row represents objective versus subjective measurement approaches. And I want to talk today about the subjective measurement approach. I'm a, I'm, I'm a psychologist by trade, and so I do a lot of surveys. So I, you know, I, I craft questions to measure both the experience and, and likelihood to engage in certain kinds of behaviors towards a company. Um, oh, if, we, let me first summarize that. So in terms of loyalty, you know, there's a, there's a big thing about the, the net promoter score and how that's the ultimate uh, customer loyalty metric you can use. And there's, there's absolutely no scientific evidence that that's the case. And I found that in my research that there are three types of loyalty. There's advocacy, retention, and purchasing. And, and each of those kinds of loyalty predict different kinds of business growth. So if you want to predict new business growth, yeah, you can, you can ask the likelihood to recommend, and th that question kind of measures the same thing as overall satisfaction, uh, likelihood to buy, willing to forgive and consider. But if you want to measure uh, growth with existing customers, you need to measure things like retention and purchasing loyalty, the, the likelihood of staying with a company, the likelihood of expanding your relationship with, with, with your given supplier, okay? So let's talk about next uh, the customer experience. Now, the, these questions, the customer experience questions, typically account for most of the questions in a relationship survey. And there are kind of two kinds of questions you can have. You can have a general uh, customer experience question, like product quality, sales account management, uh, tech support, and so forth. And then you have also the specific customer experience questions, where you kind of dive deeper into each of those general uh, customer experience questions. Like, for example, product quality, you can ask more specific questions like, you know, the reliability of the product, how satisfied are you with the features, the ease of using the product, and the availability of the product, and so forth. Now, now so what companies do, so, so as a company, you can ask either the general questions or the specific questions or both. And, and what I found is that the, 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 the best questions, and I'll show you later, are the more general questions because you, customers really can't distinguish among those specific questions when, when they're asked in a survey. So these are the seven questions that I typically use when, when I uh, assess the customer experience. Uh, one is ease of doing business all the way down to future product and company direction. And these kind of measure various, the, the entire customer lifestyle cycle from marketing to sales to service. Okay. So, so I did a study uh, with some actual clients and some of these clients had both general questions and specific questions in their survey. And I want to see uh, how well these customer experience questions predicted uh, uh, customer loyalty. And so I did a, a stepwise regression analysis. And I found that, for example, in company A, uh, we, we see that the se seven general questions they had ha accounted for 74% of the variance in customer loyalty, which is a lot. Um, and they didn't have any specific uh, customer experience questions, so I, didn't, I couldn't analyze that further. For the companies B, C, and D, they had both general questions and specific questions. So I first entered the general question to see what kind of uh, variance that they accounted for. And you see company B, the general questions accounted for 42% of the variance. When you added those extra 14 specific customer experience questions, they accounted for very little of extra variance in, in predicting customer loyalty. And the same goes for company C and company D. So, so what that tells me is that the general CX questions explain customer loyalty differences very well, and the specific questions do not add much to our understanding of what kinds of things predict customer loyalty differences. Okay. 
uh, say here on average, each specific uh, question explained less than 0.5% of the variability in customer loyalty, which means that they're, they're not very useful and they're, it's just taking it more time for the customer to complete them than it is giving you more information to understand your customer. Uh, the next area is competitive analytics. So now it's, it's important to know, to understand how well you're performing as a company, but there's research that shows that that is important, but also where you stand relative to your competition also impacts whether or not your customers will buy more from you in the future, okay? So uh, there's a study by in Harvard Business Review that showed that top-ranked companies received a greater share of wallet compared to the bottom-ranked companies. So if you want to increase you know, purchasing behavior of your, of your customers, you need to ensure that, that you are perceived as being one of the top-ranked companies in your industry. And so I, I created a question um, called the, the relative performance assessment. And it's basically just one question. Just you ask your customers to rank you relative to competitors in your usage set. So the question in the survey was, what best describes our performance compared to the competitors you use? And the rating scale is the worst to the best. Okay, and you see on the left-hand side, you've got a distribution of for, for this, this company that there are about 42% who said you're above average. So I wanted to see how well that rating predicted uh, different, different forms of customer loyalty. And you see that on the lower right graph. And you see that the RPA, the Relative Performance Assessment, was a really good predictor of, of purchasing loyalty uh, and advocacy more so than retention. And again, similar to the, the previous analysis, I wanted to see if the, if the RPA predicted uh, a more uh, loyalty behaviors above and beyond what the general uh, experience questions predicted. And you see for the, the first two columns, those measure advocacy loyalty, overall set and recommend. The RPA didn't predict much above uh, what the general CX questions predicted. Uh, also on the far right, there were new subscription, there were new, the retention index, for one extra percent of variance account for. Where I think the RPA actually makes an impact is whether or not your customers will buy more from you in the future. And we see here that just improving your relative ranking in your industry will, will help you uh, either upsell or cross-sell to your customers more effectively than if you're, uh, if you're ranked low in your industry. So understanding your ranking, so what we can do is you can correlate your RPA score with your customer experience measures to see, you know, it is, if, product, if product is more highly correlated with RPA than service, then you know that the product quality is a big determinant of your relative ranking in your industry, okay? And also to find out uh, why you're maybe ranked low or high, you can ask an open-ended question after that question to say, like, why did you think we are better or worse than our competition, and, or which competitors are better than us and why? Okay, and to know what to improve, you know, again, you can correlate your customer experience questions with your own performance, and again, ask an open-ended question about why they give you a certain low or high ranking. And finally, uh, some additional metrics you can use are more company specific. So when you, when you do a survey, you need to think about, you know, why you're using, why you're doing the survey and what kinds of uses you can get out of the questions you're asking. Don't just ask a grab bag of questions um, and don't, you know, don't send the survey out to all your colleagues and say, oh, what kind of questions do you want to ask? You need to think critically about, about, about the kinds of questions you want to ask your, your, your customers and how you use that data subsequently. So uh, in summary, a good optimal survey contains a few metrics. Uh, in all, it, it takes about maybe 20 to 24 questions to get a really solid understanding of the, of the factors that, that you need to understand to increase customer loyalty and the, and the customer experience. So you have four to six measures of customer loyalty, uh, maybe at most seven questions of the customer experience. Uh, relative performance, you can ask maybe one, two, or three questions, and just ask you more questions that are more tailored to your, your company and your, your executive's need be a, a total of five. So next, I'm going to talk about uh, big data analytics and integration. 
So big data, what is big data? Uh, big data, I think, refers to the tools and the processes of managing and utilizing large databases. Uh, so to me, big data refers to the idea that companies can extract value from collecting, uh, processing, uh, and analyzing vast quantities of data. And in fact, McKinsey, in a report uh, in October of 2011, concluded that businesses who can get a better handle on these kinds of data will more likely outperform companies that do not. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a, a, just a big data landscape. It's from the bigdatalandscape.com. I just want to give you an idea of, the, of how the, the whole big data landscape kind of formulates itself. On the bottom, we have the technologies like Hadoop that kind of does parallel processing to analyze data quickly. Next layer up, you have the infrastructure, uh, to, you know, how to embed it into your company. And the top layer is more about you know, the actual applications of how big data are used. And you see on the upper right, that's where SATA's VMware is located. Uh, it gets them to be pivotal. So there are essentially three big data approaches. And, and uh, Brian Gentile, the CEO of Jack Jaspersoft, argues for a solution-oriented approach to understanding the value of big data. So uh, first, he says, first you need to understand the problem you're trying to solve before you select your solution. And these are the three kinds of uh, approaches. One is interactive exploration, and that's good for discovering real-time patterns from your data as they emerge. <clears throat> this approach um, is used to assist real-time recommendation engines where a quick turnaround is of the essence. Uh, number two is direct batch reporting, and this is good for summarizing data into pre-built scheduled reports. And finally, batch ETL, or extract, extract transform load, is good for analyzing historical trends, looking at disparate data sources based on predefined questions. So to be sure, uh, to understand, you need to understand that big data is not just about quick analysis of your data, it's also about integration of different sources of data. And I'll come back to that later uh, to talk about you know, how companies can integrate their data around the customer. So when you think about your data and your company, it's important that you, you not just simply throw technology and tools at it. Rather than blindly adopting the latest big data technologies and solutions with no specific goals, companies need to focus on a, on a specific, specific problem they're trying to solve and match the big data solution to the big data problem that they have. Uh, let's talk about uh, value from analytics. Uh, now, there's a study in, in late 2010 from uh, I, IBM and MIT, and they asked uh, 3,000 executives uh, and, and managers and analysts about how they obtain value from their massive amounts of data. And they found that organizations that use business information and analytics outperform organizations who not. And specifically, uh, the research has found that top performing businesses were twice as likely to use analytics to guide future strategies and guide day-to-day -day operations compared to their low-performing counterparts. And additionally, in the study, uh, the researchers found that the number one obstacle to the adoption of analytics in the organization was a lack of understanding of how to use analytics to improve the business. Uh, so there's, there's simply not enough people with big data and uh, analysis skills um, available. And in fact, McKinsey, estimated that the U.S. faces a huge shortage of people who have the skills to understand and make decisions based on the analysis of big data. Uh, also, the, the researchers found that six out of 10 respondents cited that innovating to achieve competitive differentiation as a top business challenge. And additionally, the same percentage of respondents also agreed that their organization has more data than, than it can effectively use. So I'll show you later about how, how you might be able to organize your data and extract value from it in a very simple, straightforward way. Uh, there was a study last year by Accenture also that showed, uh, well, they found that the use of predictive analytics is up threefold since 2009. And, and even though more and more businesses are utilizing the power of analytics, they still find it difficult to maximize their return on investment of the analytics. And based on the survey results, Accenture outlined three things you can do to improve the value of analytics. Uh, these are right here. One is measure the right customer metrics. Uh, they found that only 20% of the executives were satisfied with the business outcomes of their existing analytics and 
analytics programs. Uh, two, you should focus on more strategic issues of, of the why, why you're doing things rather than how you're doing things. Uh, for example, they found that 39% of the executives said that the data they generate is just is, is relevant to the business strategy. So about what, 60% said it's not relevant at all. Um, number three, uh, integrate your business metrics. Uh, they found that half of the executives indicated that data integration remains a key challenge to them. And again, I'll show you later about how you can organize your data around your customer to extract more value from it. Now, when you look at, think about your data in your company, I think it, it falls in kind of these uh, five buckets. You have, first, the customer feedback right in the middle. You have loyalty, uh, relationship metrics, transaction surveys, things like that, sentiment scores. And around that, you have different kinds of data silos. You have operational metrics from your, your call center. You have partner feedback if you're, if you're an enterprise company. You have people who may have to implement your software, for, for example, into your joint customer's infrastructure. You have employee feedback, those employees that actually interact on a day-to-day -day basis with your, your customers. And on the back end, you have, or the front end, you have uh, financial metrics, revenue, uh, customer tenure, renewal contract. They're housed in an entirely separate database. So what, what I try to do is I help companies gain insight into their big data by integrating and analyzing these, all these business metrics together across all these different data silos. And by applying these big data principles to the field of CEM, you can understand the causes and consequences of customer loyalty that improves your ability to get insight about the reasons behind loyalty and satisfaction. Uh, I did a study uh, in 2009, that's actually another book I wrote in 2009, and what I found was that uh, the integration of other sources of business data with customer data is necessary for an effective CEM program. And as you see in this uh, graph here, companies who integrated operational measures with customer feedback, those in the green bars, were more satisfied with their customer feedback program and had higher customer loyalty rankings in their industry compared to companies who do not integrate those data with customer feedback at all. So again, it's, it's important that you understand all your business data, not just each data silo separately. And now I'll talk about linkage analysis. And this is, we get, start talking about how to link up these disparate data sources. Um, so I refer to this, this process of linking disparate data sources as business linkage analysis. And how you link your different metrics depends on the problem you're trying to solve or the question you're trying to answer. And different problems require different types of data that are organized or linked at the right level for, for the analysis you're, you're doing. For example, uh, there, are, you know, there, there are some popular questions that can be addressed using linkage analysis of disparate data sources. One is, what's the dollar value of improving customer satisfaction and loyalty? A lot, a, lot of, a lot of executives want to know that, well, if we, if we increase scores on our loyalty metrics, what does that mean to the bottom line? Well, if you do some linkage analysis, linking up relationship survey to financial business metrics, you can actually quantify that. Another question you can uh, ask is, which operational metrics have the biggest impact on improving customer satisfaction in the call center? Again, that, that's a different question. You want to link up operational metrics with transaction uh, satisfaction metrics. To answer that question. And finally, you might want to be interested in uh, which employee or partner factors have the biggest impact on customer satisfaction and loyalty. Again, an entirely different question that, that requires an entirely different uh, data set. For that, you want to link up your constituency satisfaction loyal, loyal metrics with your customer satisfaction metrics. And here's a, here's a way or just kind of a visual presentation of, of different kinds of linkage analyses you can do. On the, the rows represent the, the different data silos I talked about, the financial, operational, and constituency, and the columns represent the different customer feedback data sources. Uh, the first column is a relationship survey, the next one is transaction survey, and the, the last one is social media and communities like the Twitter feeds, Facebook likes, things like that. And depending on the question you, you're asking, you want to use different kinds of data sets and link those up together. And I'll talk about a few uh, later. Okay. So let's, for example, let's look at, for example, let's look at the, if you want to look at linking up relationship survey to financial metrics, 
you want to understand does our loyalty metrics impact financial uh, outcomes. You want to look at the upper left hand cell. You want to link data at the customer level, uh, and you want to you want to understand the quality of the relationship uh, that impacts the financial metrics. If you're looking at how operational metrics impact transactional trade, you want to get the middle the middle box to understand if if call center metrics actually impact uh, satisfaction with the, their call center experience. So here's the data model for for linking up customer feedback uh, with your financial metric. So if you're if you're a company who wants to understand do our loyalty metrics impact the bottom line, this is this is how you do it. First, you and, the, and I think of this linkage analysis problem is a is primarily a problem of data organization. Once you've organized your data in the right way, you can do any kind of, of analysis on it, from an analysis of variance to regression to factor analysis, what have you. But the the key the key uh, factor you have to consider is how you organize your data. So, for example, in this one, for the, the middle boxes, the colored boxes represent the customer or the account. So, on the left-hand side, we have a specific rating for that particular customer, whether it be loyalty, satisfaction, what have you. On the right-hand side of, the, of that model is the actual financial metrics. So, for each customer, they have either an X, they have both an X and a Y. You want to, you know, stack that up in your in your data set. And then you can run correlations across across X and Y to see which of the X's impacts uh, sales rates, churn rates, things like that. And here's a result that, uh, that that Oracle looked at a few years ago. So you want to know if, if their loyalty ratings actually predicted uh, uh, purchasing uh, the purchases of software, and they found that in fact. Uh, very loyal customers, those that gave a rating of 9 and 10 on the customer loyalty scale, had a 55% increase in the additional software that they purchased compared to disloyal customers. That's, and that's pretty clearly uh, impacting the bottom line. So if, if Oracle, Oracle knew that if they could increase the loyalty of their customer base, they would, they would necessarily be able to increase uh, their software sales. For this one, this is uh, looking at how operational metrics impact customer feedback or customer satisfaction. So in call centers, you know, you have you have a host of call center metrics from first call resolution, call handling time, uh, many, many, many others. And you, so you have this big dashboard in the call center and you look at you, you're tracking that and the executives want to know which ones should I really focus on. And by doing this sort of linkage analysis, you can actually identify which of those call center metrics is actually the most important in predicting satisfaction and loyalty uh, to the company. So again, so for each interaction, you have both a, a satisfaction rating and you have a, a, an operational metric, that being you know, how fast the call was handled, uh, who handled the call, um, if the call was handled on the, the, the first call and so forth. And then you can correlate those two variables together. So, for example, again, this is another Oracle example. So they have, they want to see the impact of total time to resolve the service request uh, and how that impacted satisfaction with the service request. We, and they found that, that if the total time was more than, you know, if it got greater, the satisfaction dropped dramatically. What was interesting is they found that the initial response time had no impact on the satisfaction with the service request. So. Whether or not the, the 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 response time occurred in less than a day, or four to seven days, or 14 days, that didn't matter. It didn't have any impact on whether or not the client was satisfied with their service request, which I found very very interesting. Also, uh, you can you can identify operational standards by by using uh, linkage analysis. So, for example, they found that that the number of calls to resolve SR was if, if it went, after, went more than two to three calls, they found that the satisfaction with the service request dropped dramatically. So they knew that they started setting goals that, you know, we, should need, we need to get the calls resolved within two to three calls. After that, we know our, our satisfaction is going to suffer. So that'll help set some goals. For the number of uh, ownership changes to the SR, 
they found that that was just a gradual drop. So that's just a matter of allocating resources to ensure that that uh, their call centers are able to manage the calls within one change of the SR. So in summary, there's there's kind of three big implications uh, of big data in, in in CEM or customer experience management. The uh, the first, I think, uh, is that the application of big data principles can help you ask and answer bigger questions about your customer. Uh, a successful CEM program is designed to deliver a better customer experience, which translates into a more loyal customer base. Now, the source of data in most CEM programs is gathered through customer feedback tools like surveys and social media sites. Uh, businesses can gain insight primarily by analyzing customer feedback data with little or no regard for other data sources. Now, by linking dis disparate data sources to their customer feedback data, companies gain insight about their customers that they could not achieve by looking at their customer feedback data alone. For example, businesses can now ask, and more importantly, answer these types of questions. Where do we set operational goals in our call centers? Uh, how many hours of training do employees need to ensure they satisfy customers? Uh, which call center metrics are the key determinants of customer satisfaction with the call center experience? Um, where do we need to invest in our employer relationship uh, across the employee experience touch points to ensure they deliver a great customer experience? And finally, do customers who report higher loyalty actually spend more than customers who report lower levels of loyalty? <coughs> Excuse me. So, so companies who integrate their business data to understand the correlates of customer satisfaction and loyalty can better answer these kinds of questions and consequently be in a better position to effectively allocate resources in areas that they know will help improve the customer experience and maximize customer loyalty and business growth. Uh, number two, uh, they can build the company around the customer. And by that, I mean the actual data that they use. So um, big data principles uh, can help you create a customer-centric culture and by integrating different sources of, of business data and uncovering insights about a variety of different metrics, you build interest across different organizations and understanding what's important to the customers. Now, the integration of different business data sources would necessarily involve key stakeholders from each organization. And the mere act of integrating, I think, would be a catalyst for further cross-organizational discussions about the customer um, and applying uh, a customer-centric data federation and aggregation approach to business data integration will help senior managers and leaders understand how their organization and its metrics impacts the customer. Uh, additionally, uh, the results of customer research become more applicable to other organizations or departments when their data are used. Uh, expanding the use of customer data to other departments, for example, HR, call center and marketing, helps the entire company improve the processes that are important to the customer. And uh, here are some examples of how uh, companies are using this type of research to build a customer-centric culture. Uh, for example, uh, identifying and building customer-centric operational metrics for executive dashboards. So rather than putting a, you know, hundreds of metrics at executives, you can start weeding out the, the noise and filtering that out and only presenting them the key factors that actually impact customer set and loyalty. Uh, you can integrate customer feedback into operational systems like your CRM system so frontline employees understand the, in, their interactions and attitudes of the customers. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, conducting in-depth customer research using all business data to continually gain customer insight to establish a competitive advantage. So big data technologies and processes can go a long way in helping you support your CEM program. And by taking a customer-centric approach to your big data, you'll be able, to be able to literally build your company and its data around the customers. And finally, I think a, a big implication is you're actually now predicting real customer loyalty behaviors. Now, uh, despite the existence of objective measures of customer loyalty, like the customer renews contract, recommends you and buys more, uh, customer experience management programs rely typically on customer surveys as their way to assess customer loyalty. Um, now, there, these measures are still good, but I think what, what's really important is that is that is what we're, what customers really do rather than what they say they'll likely do.
Okay. Um, so by linking up financial data and customer feedback data, you would be able to understand how the customer experience impacts real customer loyalty behaviors using objective metrics like purchase amount, uh, products purchased, products liked, products shared, and renewals of the contracts. Uh, end of quarter financial reports uh, include objective customer loyalty metrics, for example, churn rates and average revenue per user, uh, with no information about the factors that might impact those numbers. And now traditionally analyzed at the end of the quarter as standalone metrics, these objective loyalty metrics provide no insight about how to improve them. But by linking satisfaction with these customer experience, with the customer experience to these objective loyalty measures, however, lets you build predictive models to help you understand the reasons behind your financial metrics. And I think that, that was it. So, so in summary, I think I think that field of big data is 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 very useful to to help help companies understand their customers. There was a, a recent um, kind of like a almost like a survey by IBM. It was it was a IBM Big Data Challenge. And what they found is the, the most popular method, or the excuse me, the, the one that was picked the most uh, often by big data professionals as the most important big data use case was predicting customer loyalty behaviors. So if, if you're able to predict behaviors of your customers, you're able to manage that better. You're, you're able to increase growth, increase revenue, decrease churn, and so forth. So if you're able to understand how your big data impacts those customer loyalty behaviors, I think you're better off as a company. And that's it, David. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Bob. And I'll lo looking at the questions here. One of the uh, one of the questions we've got submitted is uh, looking historically. How has you know the the speed of information now that you have big data affected how you do uh, in, in the total customer experience? Right. Uh, how do you in your measurements? Right. So again, I think you look at the, the problem you're trying to solve. So in terms of quick analytics, I think that's good for like like Google searches. You know, they're, they're big. They need res results quickly. Uh, for like in Amazon as well, you need like recommendation engines that you know, like customers who bought that book will buy another book. If you, you do a search like that, you want that information quickly. There there's some problems that that don't necessarily require quick analytics. What's what's more required? What's what's required more is is how you approach your data in an intelligent, uh, thoughtful way. Uh, for example, if you're executive, you, you want to allocate resources to maybe one of three areas, either products, uh, sales, or marketing. Uh, quick analytics, I think, is not going to help you th that, that much. What you need to know is how to organize your data in a way, analyze your data in a way that gives you those insights as to, as to which area you need to allocate resources to increase customer loyalty. So again, I think you should need to focus on on the kind of question you're asking and the problem you're trying to solve before you start talking about uh, what kind of analytics you want to throw at the problem. Okay, uh, let me look at uh, the other one. Uh, they they were talking about uh, I think and you touched on it. Uh, you know, what are the normal teams you have to get together across functional organizations to you know to put this type of measurement in place and start uh, getting value out of it. Um, and I guess that, to some extent, depends on the size of the company. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, again, I think it depends on the question you're asking. If you have a, 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 quest, a problem about, about marketing, the big data marketing problem, then you need to get you know, the, maybe the customer service team or the customer analytics team along with marketing and perhaps even sales and get them together to talk about you know, what are the problems they're trying to solve and, and the kind of data that we have access to and analyze that in a way that will solve that particular problem. If you have, for example, an HR problem saying, you know what, we, we need to improve satisfaction in our call centers, maybe we can look at you know, employee factors that may impact that, well, then you need to talk to the HR people. Uh, and in fact, it, uh, back when Oracle used to be Siebel, they found that, that, that employee training, or the number of training classes that employees took actually had an impact on uh, customer satisfaction of those uh, sales reps performance. So sales reps who took five or more training courses per quarter uh, were rated as more competent than those salespeople who took uh, three or fewer training courses per quarter. 
So understanding that that problem required you, you know, extracting data from the HR system and merging that with data from the customer feedback system to see whether or not training actually had an impact on, on customer satisfaction. So again, again, it's so it's always comes down to what's the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, there's there's in that big data landscape. There's so many tools out there, and I know people can get lost. Of you know, I should should I use that tool or this application? Again, focus on on what, on what you're trying to do with the data, and, and think about 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 before big data even became a popular term. D data has always been out there, and and as scientists and researchers. You always have to find out, you know, what's the question I'm trying to ask and answer and collect data that actually addresses that. Uh, analyzing data quickly is not necessarily um, uh, a, a way to get your company, you know, ahead of the competition. You, again, you need to look at the problem you're trying to solve and apply analytics appropriately. All right. That's, uh, that's good. And I have a couple more questions here, so we'll cover those and try yeah. to get to all of them. Um, one was uh, on, I think, one of the things you brought up earlier on strategic issues uh, where you were talking about uh, leveraging the data to, you know, ch I guess, change strategies, the overall question. Do you have an example of, of that in some studies that you've done, how uh, having access to the data and doing thought-provoking uh, uh, or real uh, analysis there has helped change the strategic positioning or, or orientation of a, of a business that you've worked with? Sure. Um, for example, um, it, you look at, at any, well, I, there's, I don't want to name companies, but there, there are many companies who I've, I've worked, worked with, and they, they have they struggle with where they want to allocate resources to uh, increase loyalty. Again, loyalty is a driver of business growth, so the goal is to find out the things you can do as a company to maximize customer loyalty, whether it be renewal, advocacy, or purchasing. So what you can do is, is essentially correlate the, these different business areas. Product is one of them. Service is one of them. Uh, things like that, for example. So you, you have two areas. You want to focus either on service, improving the service, or improving the product. Now, as an executive, where do you want to invest your money that will have an impact on your on increasing loyalty. So all you need to do is essentially correlate ratings of product satisfaction and service satisfaction with measure, different measures of loyalty to find out which one's most highly correlated with loyalty. And also, you need to understand, is there, is there much improvement possibilities in each of those two areas, product or service? For example, if you have you know the, the correlation between product and loyalty and service and loyalty are the same, but you but you're performing much more poorly in service in the service area. Then I think you get bigger bang for your buck if you if you invest in improving the service aspect because improving product quality is going to be that much more difficult because you're already doing well in that area. Okay, um, and then we have a, a, more, a specific one which I think alludes back to one of the ones we were talking uh, questions earlier. But sure. it's uh, you know, where does the leadership of metrics and analytics typically reside in, in the company? Um, when you go in to do your engagements? So is it uh, one specific, or are you in integrating with, let's see, it's uh, like marketing, finance, IT, or is it a combination, cross-functional, or one group? How does that work when... That, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I've never, I've never, I, I never thought it in those terms when I approach a client. Uh, gosh, that's a really good question. I really don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I would think... In terms of, of, of any kind of program in a company, whether or not it succeeds depends on the support of, of, of upper management. If, if upper management doesn't use analytics to make their decisions, then I doubt people down below them, the frontline heroes, are going to use analytics to make their decisions. So I think I'll start at the top. Uh, I'm going to be blogging the next few weeks on, on the role of analytics in businesses. There's a study that came out by, I think, MIT again in just like late last year that, that looked at that, looked at uh, analytic leaders and analytic leaders. And I, 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 I don't recall the exact results of that study, but I will be writing about that uh, in an upcoming blog post. So if you want to follow me on Twitter or, or follow my blog, you can do that as well. Uh, again, I, th I, think it, I think it all starts at the top. If, if 
if, if you want your employees to engage in more critical thinking about how to use data in their, in their decision-making process, then you as an executive need to show them that you also use analytics to drive your decision-making process. I agree with that one. That, and I know internally here, uh, having that executive sponsorship is really critical so that you have a, a, a uniform taxonomy across every uh, metric, you know, uh, that you're doing. Uh, so everybody understands them, they get comfortable with them, and then you can, you know, consistently uh, move that ball forward. Um, sometimes it's hard to establish that baseline. And that's, I think, the next question we have is, you know, how, how would one go about establishing the baseline for uh, TCE if they don't have a program, and what, what would be the timeline to start seeing improvement? Well, that's a good question. I have a, I, I've got a self-assessment survey that companies can take that, that, that gives them feedback about best practices, if, whether or not they're adopting best practices in, in, in customer experience management, which also includes analytics. Uh, you can find that on my on my website, businessoverbroadway.com, uh, under I think the resources tab. Uh, it's a self-assessment survey. It just it it covers like uh, strategy and governance, business process integration, method, reporting, and applied research, and and just fill it out as as you know your company does it currently, and you'll, you'll kind of see where your company is falling short uh, in certain areas in in uh, improving the customer experience. Uh, in terms of timeline of how long it will take, again, I think it depends on the size of the company. Uh, big companies are like like moving a, a big ship. It, it may take a, a long time to, to, to change course. Uh, smaller companies are more agile and can make those changes more quickly. And also, it may, it may also depend on the executive sponsorship. If you got a, a hard-nosed executive who wants things done a certain way, then maybe, you know, that executive will get things done more quickly. I, m I remember when I worked at Siebel, uh, Tom Siebel was a smart dude, and he, when, when, whenever he said, you know, we're, do we're doing it a certain way, everybody did that quickly. So I think it depends on leadership and size of the company. But it's do I would guess, if I hazard a guess, I would say you probably get going and probably uh, make a big change in maybe a year. I mean, you make small changes along the way, but in terms of seeing real, real changes, meaningful changes, and with respect to how your customers see you, I'd give yourself a, a good solid year. But again, you should take that survey, fill it out, and, and see how you fare right now, and you'll know where where you're falling short and maybe where your strengths are. Maybe you're doing really well in method reporting, not doing so well in applied research. And I, what I found in my research is that is that the, the three top drivers of of whether or not a, a, a company is a loyalty leader versus a loyalty laggard is a first executive sponsorship, whether or not executives actually you know, use the data and you know, use that in, in decision making. Number two is the, the extent to which the program and the results are communicated company wide. Now it's important to note that it's not just the results are communicated, but the actual program of why you're doing that, is that communicated to the entire company? And I, cause like, I think that everybody needs to be on the same page as to why you're doing things. And three, uh, whether or not the company is engaged in doing really deep dive research in, in what's causing customer satisfaction and loyalty. So if you can do those three things as a company, you're better off than if you don't do those three things. So executive support, communicate company-wide, and uh, again, uh, merging different databases to, to do deep dive research in what's causing customer satisfaction and loyalty. That sounds good. I know we're, uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour here, so we'll do uh, some house uh, cleaning items here and, and, and uh, uh, tie, this, uh, tie this up. So I really appreciate having you today, Dr. Hayes, and uh, giving us insight Thank on you. how yeah, big data is changing how we measure business. Um, and uh, so I think your contact information is here on the slide that's up. Uh, if you need to contact Bob and have any more specific questions uh, around uh, how uh, big data and, uh, you can, and how you can put in place total customer experience measurements, uh, you can contact Bob there. Now, our Big Data Thought Leadership webinar is a series, as we mentioned before. Uh, we're all the time looking for current topics and speakers that uh, 
that would like to participate in the program uh, to get those ideas and present relevant information to you. So f please feel free to submit that to me. My email is there at the bottom, dmars at vmware.com. Any feedback is really appreciated. Our next webinar in May is Carl Cap. He, this is a, a, an amazing and a, such a growth area in gamification. Now, it's a very strange word, but it's how to leverage game techniques, uh, you know, like your Atari games, and although that, I guess, dates me, but uh, how those type of gaming techniques are being leveraged now in business to engage customers, uh, extend the capabilities uh, in, in that engagement and loyalty and things. So um, very, very unique things happening there. A lot of uh, companies now are leveraging these techniques, everything from banks to financial institutions uh, to even government. Uh, and there's, Carl has a number of different examples on how that can help uh, drive business for you in leveraging these type of techniques. So please join us uh, May 15th. So at 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time. Uh, today's webinar is recorded and we'll have the slides available at uh, ctos.net forward slash webinars. You can uh, log in there and pull those down. Uh, it'll take uh, a bit for us to get the recorded webinar up a day or so, but other than that, uh, it will be there. So we want to uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. And, then, and thank you, Bob. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody.